Okay. I actually retitled this a little bit because we are guilty sinners. Anybody that says otherwise is a liar. So they're a sinner anyway. You know, I'm a sinner who is probably going to sin again. Right? That's true. Right. Lord, forgive me. But if we have the Holy Spirit with us, the risk is minimized with the amount of times that we're going to sin. Doesn't guarantee you're never going to sin again. A little quote here The death of Jesus was the opening and the emptying of the full heart of God. It was the outgushing of that ocean of infinite mercy that heaved and panted and longed for an outlet. It was God showing how he could love a poor, guilty sinner. It's us. How we can love us. It's just, it's just an amazing thing. So, what is sin anyway? We all have different ideas about it. Doing something wrong. Doing something wrong. I kind of like to generalize it saying it's anything we do that's displeasing to God. Sin was around a long time before the Ten Commandments were given to Moses by God. That's kind of a benchmark of the things that God's saying we ought to be following. But sin was around a long time before that. It takes just one sin to be a sinner. Sin became evident with Adam and Eve. Cain killed Abel. First murder. Right? Sin was out there. Are you a sinner? Yes. Consider this. Because a lot of people think that they're not sinners. They think that, you know, they're, they're holier than thou. And you know what? I got, I've gotten baptized and I came up again and I just don't sin anymore. Yeah, right. Mm hmm. You know, everyone sometimes is told a lie. Right? I think lying is the easiest sin that's out there. <laughs> People lie to get ahead. They lie to get themselves out of a situation. They're lying all the time. I see lies on TV commercials. You know, saying it's okay to lie. I see lie on TV shows. I see lies in the media. Who are you going to believe? You're going to believe the Word of God. Because there's no lie in there. Most of us, I'm sure, would also have to admit that we've been a thief at some point in time in our life. A thief. A thief. You're at the office and you go to the supply cabinet. And you go, you know what? I, I think I'm going to take a couple of these pads and paper and some of these pens home for my kids for school. Because I don't want to buy it. But guess what? You're stealing from your employer. You're a thief. You're stealing from your employer when you're not doing your job and you're on the phone and you're texting and doing all these other things. You're getting paid to do a job. You're stealing from your employer. People don't think that that's a sin. We're all thieves in one way or another. Perhaps you snatch something that didn't belong to you. Hmm? Everybody's done that too. Everybody. Everybody's done that. Yeah, that's where we become a thief. That's where we become a thief. We just kind of like, you don't want to take that. We snatched it right up. Most of us also have to admit we've lost it after somebody. Happens. Goes along in your mind. Also, have you ever put a priority before God? God's supposed to be first in our lives. What are the priorities that you're putting before God? Right. Just not right. Have you ever had a bad thought? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have. We all have. We think these things. Have you been envious of what somebody else has? We all can relate to every one of these. We can't say that we're exempt from any of them. In fact, we can't keep the Ten Commandments. We're sinners. Plain and simple. 
There's nothing to argue there. Amen. Now, if we're guilty of sin, we can't enter into the holy presence of God in heaven. But the Bible has clearly said to us there's a reason why John 3.16 is really top to everybody's brain. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God knew that we were all sinners. At one time, he just wiped out all but a few people because of the corruptness in the world. Yes. And even with that, sin mushroomed again. So everybody remembers John 3.16, but did they really understand the true meaning behind it? There's other scriptures that back that up. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We hear that often when we're receiving communion. The blood was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. If there wasn't any sin, that would not have been necessary. And then, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. The only one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the world. That one person took all those sins on his shoulders. Past, present, and future. Because he knew. God knew. Man is weak. Satan is out there tempting us all the time. So, bottom line, based on these scriptures I'm, I'm, I'm putting out here, we have to say that sin is a universal problem. Right? It's a universal problem. Just like addictions are big problems, opioids are big problems. There's a lot of big problems out there that are focused on, that are talked about, but sin being the biggest problem of all, you don't hear about that in the news media now, do you? No. You don't hear about any of that. If it was a big focus, we might have a better awareness. And this might be a much better world to live in if that focus were there. Then in Romans, because sin is a universal problem, Romans points this out. For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. This is the Apostle Paul speaking here. And he said, there's no difference among human beings because we all have sin. None of us are different from anybody else. We all have sin. And the entire human race has plunged into sin, originating with Adam and Eve. Not only did all sin, but all fall short. The simple fact is, as a sinner... Not a single human being by his own efforts is able to measure up to the glory of God. God desires that we share the splendor and that we become like him. And that is Christ-like. A couple of years ago, I preached on what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? If you're in a situation, you're asking yourself the question, what would Jesus do? And when you ask yourself that question, you, you kind of can become Christ-like because you're going to get the answer from the Holy Spirit to guide you in the right direction. Without asking, asking yourself that question, you're just going to do what you want to do, not what's pleasing to Him. So that's a problem. And then also to point out that this is such a universal problem, in Ecclesiastes 7.20, it says, indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous. No one who does what is right and never sins. 
And then following that up with Psalms 14, 3, all have turned away, all have become corrupt. There is not one who does good, not even one. So these three scriptures are telling us how universal the problem of sin is. Not one person is righteous. Not one of us can measure up. Not one. Not one. Why are we all guilty of sin? We know when we sin, we cannot blame anybody but ourselves. We cannot use the excuse that, oh, it's been passed on from generation to generation, wickedness and, and, and yeah. corruption and all of this, you know, that, that emanated from my grandfather and then my dad and then it came to me. Right. No! We're guilty of the sin on our own. It's not like, you know, a physical condition that can be hereditary. This is a mental thing. This is your mind, your thoughts, your process, your connection with God, or the lack thereof. Without being connected to God, we're going to be strayed all kinds of ways. Sin becomes very dominant in our lives. Romans 7, 9. Once I was alive apart from the law, but then the commandments came and sin sprang to life and I died. Keep in mind that the strength of sin is the law. Since we all have that sinful nature, the law is bound to arouse the nature the way a magnet draws a piece of steel. It's the nature that's going to draw you in. There's something in our human nature that wants to rebel whenever we're told not to do something. How many people here have ever people watched? I do it as a form of entertainment. I'll admit that. I was, I was at the airport once and I saw a sign where they had just painted some stuff. And the sign says, do not touch. People see that sign, you can see fresh paint. You know what? Lot, many of the people that I saw went by there and they, they, they did touch it. They wanted to see if that paint was wet or whatever. The sign you know, specifically says, do not touch. Okay? People see that and they go, you know what? I'm exempt from that. There's a lot of signs that say don't do this or don't do that. But people in their own mind say, you know what? I'm exempt from that. I'm doing it anyway. Right? When you're raising your children, you tell your children, don't do this or don't do that. My mother used to say, now, I don't want you guys to get down to that creek today and get your sneakers all wet. Guess what we did? First thing we did, we went down to that creek and we stood right in that water just to be defiant. You know? So we have this rebellious characteristic you know? So believers who try to live by rules and regulations discover their legalistic system arouses more sin, creates more problems because we want to rebel. As I said earlier, I, I, I think the uh, easiest sin is a sin that people tell a lie. But you know what? You can look at somebody and on the outside, on that outside facade, you say, well, I they're a pretty good person. The way you know they talk, the way they conduct themselves, and so on and so forth. But you don't know what's going on in their head. You have no idea what's going on behind closed doors. It's kind of like a facade on the front of a house. You look at a house and say, wow, it's a beautiful house. And you go behind the doors and you go, whoa, this place is a junk mess. You know, heaped up, hasn't been cleaned. It's just a yeah, same thing. There's a facade that people put on. What's really behind those closed doors? The only one who knows is, Je is the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows what's going on behind closed doors. Those closed doors is just what you're thinking about in your head as well. Ephesians 5.17 Therefore do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. 
Now, this is kind of hard to understand and discern between the Lord's will and your own thoughts and your own will. And we will talk about as the Lord lead, leads this ministry, we have to pause and take, 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 take back and think about where God is directing us, trying to discern where we're being led. So you don't want to be foolish, basically be unwise. Understand what the Lord's will is. How are you going to understand that? Read the Bible. That's right. Read the Bible. It's going to start to tell you what the Lord is. Because then you're going to understand what pleases God. And I said earlier, if it's unpleasing to God, it's got to be a sin. Don't, you know, it's not, he's not happy with you. So, you know, we're his children. That's right. Just like we want, you know, we try and direct our children so we're happy with them. We're his children. He's trying to direct us so he's happy with us. Doesn't say he doesn't love us. He always loves us. He always loves us. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to you, shame. Really what I get out of this is bad company corrupts good character. You can take one good person That's right. and put them amongst a dozen people that aren't so good. Guess what's going to happen? That one good person is going to start to be influenced a little bit. Then he's going to be influenced a lot. And all of a sudden, that one good person is never is not good anymore. So it's who you're associating with, who you're hanging out with. That's right. Or where are you going to hear the message? Some preachers, some ministers are preaching a message that's going to tickle the ears. They're going to mislead and misguide. And the Bible warns us about false teachers. Guess what? They're leading you down the wrong course. That's right. They're leading you in a, in, in, in a place where they, they, they claim they have this great knowledge, but they really don't. They're leading you in the wrong direction. But we can't blame anybody. We can't blame anything we hear or see for our own sins. We can only blame ourselves. We are sinners by our own choice and we've talked about choice before we choose to do it or we chose to do it choose like i said it's a good somebody in english would say what's he saying out there we chose to do it and we also sometimes think you know what i know this is wrong but i'm just going to do it this one time i might not be caught sometimes you do get caught and then in isaiah I want to load this space. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all us. All of us. Think about it. You know, sheep follow the herd. But then they start to stray off, and the ones that stray off are straying off on their own accord, on their own mind, they're not staying together. We the fellowship are here. We are sheep to gather together to be fed on the word of God. So that we understand that this flock is, is brought together to listen to God's word, to help each other, to keep each other in check, to be accountable with each other. You've heard me talk about having accountability. If you share with somebody very close what your problems are, they can help you stay in check and pray with you to bring it all to the Lord. That's what it's all about. 1 Corinthians, no temptation has ever overtaken you except what is in common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Think about that. He knows what your load is capable of. And he's not going to have temptation go beyond what you can bear. But, are you giving in to that temptation? So it says, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. 
so that you can endure it. He's going to provide a way out for you because he's a loving God. He's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. So I'm sure by now, y'all get it. We are all sinners. And Jesus, by the way of the Holy Spirit, can guide us to make decisions and choices that are pleasing to God. When you let the armor down that we have up here every week, we talk about the armor. When you let the armor down, sin will happen. Happens to me. I let that armor down. Things, you know, hmm, won't even go there. But, but, I want you all to turn and face the back of the room real quick. What do you see on that wall? Cross. See a cross. Okay, turn front. <laughs> Jesus bore our sins on the cross. I personally am so very thankful to Jesus Christ who paid the price for my sins so that I can freely obtain salvation and escape eternal punishment yes. which would be my due justice for my sins yes. he took it on for me and when I thought about the death of Jesus it was so cruel beyond imagination he paid our penalty of sin because He loves you and He loves me. Amen. Now, think about this. He was beaten. The whip ripped the flesh off His back. He was spit on and mocked. A crown of thorns was pressed into His head. He was made to carry a very heavy cross in that beaten and weakened state. Then his hands and feet were nailed to that cross. He was hung on the cross to die in shame. It's evident that his love for you and me surpasses any human being's love here on earth. Now, if you close your eyes and imagine that kind of torment, that physical pain that he went through for you and you and you and you and me, all of us, you think about that, you know that you have to be thankful and grateful for what he did. So you see, salvation cannot be earned. It can't be earned. But some people think they can get themselves into heaven on their own. It's not possible because we can't keep the law. But if somebody did get there or tried to get there on their own, they'd be boasting and not giving God glory and honor as we should. That's right. And you got a lot of people out there that are boasting about this, that, and the other thing. And when you're boasting, you're hiding something, I think, and you're not giving God the glory. Everybody needs to realize they can't get to heaven by doing good works. They can't get to heaven by going to church. I know some people say, I go every Sunday and I punch my ticket. I'm going to heaven. It doesn't work that way. No. We go to heaven because of the cross, because of what he did on the cross for us. Again, as stated in John 3, 16, it tells us that he sent his only begotten son. Would you send your child for somebody else to die for them? Very hard to think about that. Jesus paid the price for us. By faith, we accept his gift of salvation. We trust Jesus to get us to heaven. We trust Jesus. And every blessing we have in our lives, our Christian lives today, comes because of the cross. Amen. Amen.